C'est avec plaisir que d'abord je suis ici, parce que j'ai une longue histoire de séjour à Paris, à travailler à, à Jussieu, mais aussi pour les collaborations avec différentes personnes, dont certaines vont être mentionnées aujourd'hui. Euh, et j'ai aussi beaucoup de plaisir à présenter ce sujet parce que, vous allez voir, c'est quelque chose de gay, disons, fun. So I'm going to move in English. Oh, sinon, je vais m'en mêler les pinceaux. Ça semble tout à fait clair. Um, je viens... Uh, I'm coming from Vancouver. Vancouver is located, and especially my, the University of British Columbia, on the unseat of, of, of an unseated traditional ter territory that belongs to the Muscarian people. And I'll expand on that tomorrow, but it's important to acknowledge that we are basically based on a land that is not ours. I uh, really like this perspective talking about environmental studies. It's the cosmic calendar, and I think the concept was introduced by Carl Sagan many years ago. And why this is important is that basically it emphasizes when the human being arrives, which is sometimes there in the last millisecond, And as we have occupied the planet and multiplied ourselves, we also have had an impact that has been dismantling things that have made billion years to establish themselves. So it's really at the end here, that's the last 60 seconds, that's where we are as human beings. Major impact on planet Earth. So I'm a geologist by training. We'll focus on something happening here, talking about honey, and then seeing how we can apply what we found in honey in salmon. For, to put that in a context, we're going to use some data that we produced on the Cascades volcanoes that are located uh, around Vancouver and that basically occur over this time period. Mostly, the topic today is urban geochemistry. Why is urban geochemistry interesting to study? We're trying to assess our impact. And what we're trying to assess is the impact, for instance, of the lead that was added to gasoline and that has been accumulating in the environment. Most of you young people don't know there was lead added gasoline. The problem is that that lead hasn't gone anywhere. It has accumulated in the environment and hasn't been washed out. Another issue is recently is all the uses of batteries and a lot of the batteries for cars, for um, all kinds of applications, have a lot of lead. And then Vancouver is uh, one of the largest ports in North America and you will see that this comes into play pretty significantly in our consideration. Now looking at urban, when we consider urban geochemistry, we have to look at various uh, consideration. The temporal scale is rapid. The city landscapes evolve very fast, at least in a city like Vancouver. I would probably wouldn't say the same in Paris, even if there are a lot of constructions but it changes a lot. The sp spatial scale is very small. There are many pollution sources, and we still have the legacy contaminants. We also have various land users. We have some um, field field fields where we grow vegetables and fruit. Uh, we have a rapid population growth, and all kinds of things come into play. Now, Most of us have a tendency to think that pollution is a recent phenomenon, or lead pollution, because we're mostly going to focus on this. It turns out that um, lead is a metal that's very malleable and that is easily melted and then worked on. was already used by the Greeks and the Romans, and as some of you might know, 
the decline of the Roman Empire is probably related to lead poisoning. All the vials, the pipes, everything was in lead and they ended up uh, dying from a lead intoxication. Clearly, the industrial uh, era here in, in the UK is a major spike in pollution and today all our economic activities and you don't need a port, you have the same here in Paris. So where does that take us? We have many factors to take into play and various reservoirs. Obviously, the soil, the pedosphere and the rocks our cities are built on come into play. All the biosphere as a whole, and we'll see that we're going to use bees as a biomonitor, and that's true for many other organisms, they are vector of transport of pollution. Atmosphere, things are distributed in the atmosphere, and as a side uh, observation, I'm pretty impressed actually, uh, the atmosphere in Paris appears to be cleaner than what it used to be. Uh, yesterday, I went on the top of the Tour Montparnasse, was a clear, was not a thick uh, layer of um, smog, pretty impressive, nice to see. And then clearly the water is another thing to take into account. Lead is a heavy metal, it's almost the heaviest metal we have access to, it has an atomic number of 82, and importantly we like, as geochemists, we like using lead because it has various isotopes and the, different, the relative proportion of these different isotopes is telling us something about the source of the metal. It's the equivalent of the fingerprint. And for those of you, if you look at the significance of what a fingerprint is, it's a unique signature of a human being. It's as good as it can be. I would say lead is not as good, but it's very useful. So to trace the source, we use lead isotopes. Now, how, can, how does somebody working on volcanoes and other rocks get interested in working on honey? It's actually a fun uh, little uh, story. I was talking to a friend of mine who had a very good friend who was a beekeeper in downtown Vancouver. And that beekeeper was working, and I want to emphasize the role of this nonprofit organization, Hives for Humanity. The beekeeper was helping Hives for Humanity setting up beehives in the city, basically with the idea of getting people out of the street, getting them motivated, and um, each one of them had, um, was responsible for a hive, but they kept being teased saying, how do you know your honey is clean? I said, you know, casually, I can help. Just give me 10 samples, and those are the first 10 samples we analyzed. I couldn't help for organic products. One of the concerns was potentially some drugs, but we could analyze for metal. And uh, that's how this whole project started. It turns out that Everybody is fascinated by bees and by honey. Um, and we ended up with a lot of samples. So at first I started that on my own, and then and a lot of the work that will be presented in this talk was the PhD thesis of my student, Kay Smith. So why honey? It's actually very interesting. We're talking about the Western honeybee, so in Vancouver it's the same honeybee than here, and if you wonder why I'm talking about ho Vancouver, don't worry, we're going to get to Paris later on. So it's the casual, it's Apis mellifera, which is a common bee everywhere. The reason why this is interesting to study the local environment in a city is that the bees do the sampling for you. They are 
going within two, three kilometers. As a for, that's their foraging radius. And they basically sample all domains of interest, air, soil, water, vegetation. And honey has been analyzed for many years for trace elements, but it had never been analyzed for what we call isotopic fingerprinting, lead isotopes. Now, why honey? It turns out that in the greater Vancouver area, which has about 2 million people, there are 17,000 beehives. People have beehives in their garden, and it turns out that there are many beehives just about everywhere. So, the, this is giving you the, the, the path. We have the contaminants that are in the air, soil, and water, in the vegetation. The bee collects it, and it ends, ends up in the honey. Now, what one thing, which is a little bit annoying, honey is mostly organic material. That's what this is. To analyze the metal content, we're dealing with, an, so that's the inorganic fraction, it's between 0.04 and 0.2% by weight of your honey. So we deal with only a minor fraction of the honey. And um, what it does, it's, so the key question was, can we have the hives, the hives products as biomonitors and are faithful as they related to the environment? We're going to look at this. We're going to talk about the, the bees, the honey, pollen, and then an ex another study to calibrate of the particulate matter. We did a lot of field sampling. Kate actually went to a training to become a beekeeper. She bought her own suit, and so she became very good at it. We, so we had the honey, but we also have used the pollen, capped honey, um, cross-section, all kinds of um, various components. Now, we're dealing, hopefully, we're dealing with very, very low levels of metals. And in order to do that, we need to work in a very clean environment, and we also need to sample very cleanly. So that's the labs we have used. You can see they're all white. I like the, them being white because that's a symbol of, of being clean, and that's not a very nice statement to make when you take the second meaning of that term. But suffice to say that the air quality is governed by the presence of absolute filter that basically take away most of the particles in the air. So we put our honey there. I took a bet at the very early stages of the process, decided to buy a special microwave oven so that we could dissolve the honey and extract the metal. Now that was $50,000. That was a risky bet on my part, but I'm really glad I did that because we ended up analyzing, I don't even remember how many hundred samples of honey. We dissolved, so we dissolved it into these um, big um, Teflon tubes, then processed it in the clean labs, and analyzed the lead isotopic composition on this instrument, which is a high resolution ICPMS, and the trace metal analysis were just done on a quadrupole instrument. So, on the first, the basis of the first 10 samples that are analyzed as a complementary thing uh, with the, the beekeeper, we could see that the levels were relatively low. We could also see that there seems to be a distribution in metal concentration as we go away from downtown Vancouver. Um, the first picture I showed you showed uh, Stanley Park, which is a big park uh, next to downtown Vancouver. You can see in red here, and we use the same color code everywhere, we have high density zoning. In uh, pale yellow, we have medium density zoning. Blue is more residential, and dark blue is agricultural rural. We have two 
uh, checkpoints. One is a remote background. It's on an island, pretty far away from, from the city. And the other one is on another island, but close by to the port where all the fares go. So that first sampling, we were given the vials used by Hives for Humanity. I was questioning how clean this honey was. I mean, had it been sampled properly, or clean were the vessels before um, the honey wa was put in them. So we, we did everything, and it was very, very coherent. Why is, I you're going to say, I keep mentioning these boats, and this is actually something that's driving me crazy in, in Vancouver. It's in a beautiful setting. You have downtown here. UBC is at the end here. Here's Stanley Park. And you can see all these huge container ships. Some of them, and during the pandemic, was even worse. They just hang out there. Idle, idle and uh, put their smoke and who knows what they put in the bay. That's a typical uh, summer picture where you have Baker in the background and you can see in the, that's the uh, downtown, you can see all these huge container ships there. It's a big problem. So what do the results tell us? We have done it's a plot here where we have the regional distance from the port of Vancouver. So we go from here and we go away in this direction. And basically what you can see for various metals or trace metals that will document some anthropogenic impact that as you go away from the city, your concentration decreases sharply and pretty quickly. Huh? Um, Galliano, remember, that's the island. We basically have background levels in Galliano, except a couple of local interference, but that's really minor. So big decrease. Our background was the right sample. It's very low in everything. On Bowen Island, so Bowen is there, we have more noise that's essentially related to the fact that most of the ferries go by Bowen, and there are many. There's basically a small ferry every 15 minutes or so. Um, so the good news was the lead levels were relatively low. 180 ppb or nanogram per gram, that was the highest level we measured. Most are below 40 ppb. Now, if we compare this with um, worldwide honey, we can see that we have values that go up to more than 3,000 ppb in some uh, honey in Poland and uh, other uh, close by uh, metal processing plants. Plant. That number probably doesn't give you, tell you very much. The ppb is the equivalent of a drop of water in an Olympic site swimming pool. That shows you how low the levels of lead is in the honey of downtown Vancouver. And you will be surprised to find out that it's not very different in Vancouver, uh, in uh, Paris. How I've talked to you about lead isotopes. How do these work? Basically, so that's the fingerprint of, of lead, the metal lead. It's related to the fact that three of the four lead isotopes are coming from the decay of long-lived um, radiogenic isotopes. Uranium-238 provides decays into lead-206, 235 uranium in lead-207, and thorium-232 in lead-208. Basically, what that means is that the signature of the lead isotopes is directly representative of the signature of the source of either your rock, your metal, your contaminant. It's a very powerful tool. So after measuring our metal concentration, we decide to try to measure the lead isotopic composition. And this is a, a complicated diagram, or it looks complicated. The main point is that we have three lead isotopes. It's two ratios, with one being the same. 
And what I wanted to show you is that because we had very, very low level or else for this lead isotopic composition is still relatively high. That was four or five years ago. We have improved our sensitivity and now we are about one third of this. But the main point is that if you group your samples by um, use of the land, you see that circled here in red is the downtown honey. And as you go away from downtown, so where you go into resident residential area, which is in blue, or you go in rural area, which is, um, or the colors change, in green here, you go into this direction. And if you do um, principal component analysis of these samples, you see that they basically have one common component and then two different contribution to their lead isotopic composition. That trend here is going from the composition of the local volcanoes, and that's exactly what I talked about last Tuesday. So we use the lead isotopic composition of the local volcanoes as the background uh, component. And in that direction, we go towards anthropogenic lead. There's nothing natural in Vancouver that has this lead, this lead isotopic composition. So we have five years of sampling. It was completely coherent. At the beginning, we just did honey. Then we did new, new hives. We wanted to see if the material of the hive itself was affecting the honey isotopic composition in case, you know, old lead paint was used or something. We also wanted to see what other bee products were doing and how, if it was easier to deal with. So this is the honey. We, you have seen this data. In red, we have the city honey. And in blue, we have suburban and rural. Concentration variation between 1 and 110 ppb. If we look at the bees, you can see that the bees have significantly higher lead concentration. And that's not too surprising. The bees carry the particles, and so the dust particles, and that's why their lead levels is higher. Now, if you look at the lead isotopic composition, you have the same thing. What is close to the city is more towards the upper left of the diagram, and when you go away from the city, you go towards the lower height of the diagram. It's very coherent. I forgot to mention that Kate did some modeling, and uh, you have the same uh, here, where you have the lead isotopic composition and uh, with the surface of, um, and surface of concentration, and you can see that the highest concentration are near downtown, and as you go away from downtown, the level decrease. Same thing in the bee tissue, and same thing if we do pollen. You can see that the pollen concentration are in between. That's a quite interesting observation because, and that's absolutely systematic, and people have seen that in other parts of the world. It shows that the honey processing, so when the bees make the honey, they clean, they clean what they don't want. So same distribution here for the bee pollen. And um, all these maps are very coherent. And basically, all these trace elements distribution patterns are coherent with a city. All the trace elements associated with human activities, such as lead, zinc, vanadium, titanium, antimony, are elevated re relative to the rural background close to the city center. The lead concentration are low. Now, the key question is, is it safe? And I don't want to go there because some people will argue that any amount of lead is never safe. 
But with the concentration that we have in, in Vancouver or that we have in Paris, you would have to eat 600 grams of honey per day to reach the, the level um, recognized by the US uh, Environmental Protection Agency. I think you'll have other problems uh, before you're gonna end up with a sugar overdose or you're gonna end up uh, with something else before you have a problem of um, lead contamination. But so, very coherent uh, patterns. So that's the same thing, isoscapes of the lead uh, isotopic composition. When you go towards the, the center of the city, so downtown is here, you can see that that's the highest level. The winds are mostly going into this direction also, which is why there is a concentration on the foothills too. And as you go away, you go towards natural geological isotopic composition. Obviously, the errors related to these lead isotopic compositions are related also to the density of sampling and they increase when we go away because we had way less sample. Um, a couple of extra application. We wanted to define the modern baseline in Vancouver. So that's basically our background. And, and the natural input, the legacy input, and then the anthropogenic contribution. To do that, we, want to, we analyzed some souls and some particle matters. And um, Kate sampled some top souls, so basically only look, looking at the upper part of the souls, and collected a series of uh, particle matter, including some collected up in the mountains in Whistler because we wanted to go away from, from the city and see what's the natural background surrounding Vancouver. So we have our same diagram, lead lead. The shape here with a gradation of color is our honey, red towards the city, blue towards nature, agricultural honey. And what you can see that if we do a total digestion of the souls, the ones that are coming from the downtown have values up here in red, the one in residential suburban are here in white, and agricultural or rural are in blue. Same tendency than the honey. Now, Key question is how can we make in the soul the difference between the anthropogenic lead, so the recent lead added by our activities, and the natural lead? For that, we did some leaching experiment. So just analyze the lead exchangeable fraction. And what you see is actually you push these data even further further towards anthropogenic value in that direction, which showed actually that a lot of the mobile lead, so recent lead, is related to anthropogenic activities. That worked pretty well. Um, the concentration, same thing. Look at the concentration of lead in the topsoil. The highest level are observed in the city, so the highest level in red here and yellow are from downtown area. Very nice correlation between the souls and, and the honey. But that's broad picture. If we do a one-on-one -on -one correlation, what we see is that it works very well for the isotopic signature and the lead concentration. What we have here, it's a correl correlation coefficient between the lead isotopic composition and then values concentration in between the honey and the topsoil, the bees and the topsoil, and so on. And basically what you see, the only correlation that are significant are the one highlighted it here in red, is that it doesn't work very well. At the same time, it's not too surprising. The it's like I wanted to study the pollution in this room. 
I do that and then I go do the analysis, they are more difficult paths. So the honey is a good proxy, but it's not a direct proxy for the composition of the city. That's why we did also some particulate matters with three sampling sites, um, one in downtown Vancouver on the top of one of the fancy hotel that also has a beehive, one on a weather station at one of the busiest intersections, and one on the rooftop of our department at the University of British Columbia. And uh, basically what we see, so we have our honey here, uh, we can see that our particle, so again, in red, it's on top of the Fairmont Hotel, in orange, it's Clark, and in blue, it's away. Same general distribution. Whistler was interesting. We had a series of samples distributed through the, uh, the season, and you, you can, what they're doing there, it has nothing to do with sampling pollution. It's studying the, dip the movement of water masses. And when uh, the wind brings material that's dominated from coming directly from the Pacific, you can see that the isotopic composition are moving in here, while it's more local wind, it's here. Slight differences, but significant. So by studying these, all these components, we have a better idea of what's happening. Uh, we still don't really know what the impact, and obviously as a geologist, we're not trained to do upon epidemiology and public health studies. But clearly, the ships are a major component in Vancouver, which is also reflected by these studies of uh, particle matters and black carbon, showing that it's uh, basically the same map than what we see in honey. Now, why is honey, um, and, and it's actually used a lot. First, there are many people who have honey. It's also relatively easy to analyze, not for lead isotopic composition, but for metals. So I think we showed that we have a bio indicator. It worked very well in, in Vancouver. If we just look at trace elements, we don't really know where the source of the metal is, while the lead isotopic composition help, and I'm going to give you the final answer in, in, in a minute or two. Um, so where do we go from there? Well, you guys live in Paris. When the Notre Dame fire happened, I was actually on the tarmac in Vancouver on a flight to Paris, April 15, 2019. Clearly, a lot of lead was distributed in the environment, a huge amount of work. I talked to Catherine Chauvel, and this led to a collaboration with IPGP and Biopic. We, Biopic is a local beekeeper, and their name came to us because they were the ones maintaining the beehive just next to Notre Dame. So, what we have looked at in Vancouver, it's long time patterns. The question here is, would lead be useful as a biomonitor for an acute pollution event? Uh, those are pictures I took a week after, and what you see here, it's actually pretty scary, you see here in the holes of Notre Dame, I mean, those were holes there before, huh? they were air holes, um, let basically leaked out. It melted and it leaked out. I also told you that lead is pretty volatile and um, so it has been distributed in the environment and these are the hives just next to the cathedral. What was very interesting, and if you look at the press, it very quickly focused on this. Um, it, it made it all the way around the world, the bees, next to Notre Dame survived. Quite remarkable. Here is um, our collaborator from Bi Biopic, Sylvie. She is actually a biologist PhD. Um, that's what she did. She did a degree in, in biology. 
and she's not taking care of the many, many hives in Paris. So what we see here in the black dots are all the hives that were sampled. There are a couple of important points for uh, what happened there. The wind on that day was not, and I think it shows better here, yeah. The wind on that day was not a usual wind in Paris. That's the distribution of the, the, the Paris wind map, uh, basically between April 2019 and April 2020. You can see that the dominant winds are in this direction. That day it went into that direction. What I'm showing here and is three different zones in Paris. In red are our harness within the, the city itself, within the peripheric. In yellow are other harness from uh, various spots, not, not too far away. And then move, light move, is basically in, I wouldn't call it the countryside, but it's, it's far away enough that uh, you wouldn't expect that wind to affect it. The size of the circle is proportional to the lead concentration. And actually, what you do if you take this line here, which is here, that's the, the traverse we made, with the lead concentration, Notre Dame is here, basically what you see is that down the wind from Notre Dame, so the fire happened here, and just after that, the honey that was collected the, the summer 2019, you can see a, a drastic increase in lead concentration. Now it's a drastic increase, but look at the level. We are at 80 ppb. I find that completely fascinating. What's also fascinating is that some of these samples here, basically on the top of buildings around the periphery, have levels that are as low as Vancouver. But it's on top of buildings, it's fifth to sixth floor. Lead is heavy and usually goes to the bottom. So there was a clear impact of the Notre Dame fire. Now, if we look at lead isotopic composition, I'm not going to guide you through this. The bottom line is we have no signal. Why do we have no signal or no clean signal? It's basically because lead has been used in Paris for centuries. And so everything is mixed. We have lead from Spain. We have lead from, and hopefully you see better than I do, lead from Spain, lead, lead from... Um, uh, that's the Rio Tinto, led from um, um, the Lake Lac Blanc, and, and so on. There is lead coming from all over Europe with signals that are with isotopic composition that are not that different. So everything is mixed, and then there is also a very strong overarching signal from the lead that was added to gasoline. So. We could trace the signal of the concentration for, for the far, but we couldn't uh, precisely say, I mean, you can't see the difference in lead isotopic composition. This being said, the um, composition of the lead from the spa, so the, that, was the, that had the, the highest concentration of lead and that was basically completely melted, is here, it's represented by this, this star. So, actually the collaboration with IPGP started, we had done the study in, in, in Vancouver, we, I wanted, I'm from Europe, I wanted to see what was happening in Europe. We had some uh, local honey from um, the rhone Alp region around Grenoble. It's basically from hives that people had in their garden. And if we look at the lead concentration versus other metals in the Paris honey, and then you compare with those from the Rhone Alp, you see completely different trends, which is not too surprising. It just shows that there are different metal distribution, and most importantly, that the use of the metal is different. So 
I think it was pretty convincing that lead also works in the case of an acute pollution event. Um, we also could compare of data or data with a study done by a professor at Columbia University in, in uh, New York who sampled more than 300 soil samples in, in Paris just after the fire and the distribution map is exactly the same. What's very interesting in this study is what we call community science. We had so many requests of people who wanted to know if their honey was clear that we de developed sampling kits that are metal free, that are easy to use. We have provided instructions in French or in English, depending where we went. And it's an easy supply. We use a wood stick to sample the honey and Nalgene, clean Nalgene vessel so that they clean. That's the, uh, all the honey we obtained from around the world. And we did a general comparison. And basically what that shows, and we again in this lead lead diagram, where all the honeys from the world are distributed on a mixing line between the, leg so that's the legacy lead line, which is a mixing line between the lead that was added to gasoline in Europe and the lead that was added to gasoline in North America. And basically, everywhere you go in the world, depending where people had their gasoline, the isotopic composition is, is plotting the big trends here. You can see that the, f the honey from France are here, the honey from Vancouver are here, and the honey from Australia are up there. That's uh, a study by uh, a collaborator, uh, Mark Taylor, and it basically broken helis in Australia. So you can s nicely see the trend. And this distribution, I, um, there's no point me going into all the details, but basically what you see is that in North America, here for instance in green, the distribution marks match what people have found in wine, in vinegars, um, you can see here, for instance, the vinegars in, in uh, California, they match what, where we find the honey. And same thing for the aerosols analyzed, it's all matching very well. What's the next thing we're doing? And then I don't think we're going to do any more honey. We came up with the idea that it would be interesting to... Uh, the beekeepers have kept producing honey. The bees have been alive during the pandemic, what people call the anthropos. And uh, what you see here, it's the average NO2 emission in Paris in, in March 2019. So when everything was active, you can see big concentration. While during the lockdown, you can see that the levels are, very, are much, much lower. Same thing here in Eastern Asia. So we have a study, and uh, we are right now analyzing a repeat of everything in the summer 2021. In short, it's very interesting. We did Vancouver, we did Brussels. In Brussels, it's all the suburbs. When the lockdown happened, the, metal, the elevated metal levels moved from the center of the city to the suburbs. We haven't done that in Paris, huh, but... Uh, it's a fun study. I'm going to spend the last five <coughs> minutes talking about another project, which is a direct application of what we did with honey. It's um, salmon. And we're still in Vancouver. Vancouver is up there. We have a very big hole of data here. The Pacific is the widest ocean. Uh, we wanted to know what's happening there. And to do that, we wanted to look at the various contribution of um, inland sources, coastal sources, and the open ocean. And we took the hypothesis that the Asian industries have a significant influence on the lead isotopic composition of the ocean. And for that, we looked at fish and selfish. Again, because lead isotopes are, are a conservative tracer of the source. So here we are, 
British Columbia, Vancouver is done here, Vancouver Island, which is very big, uh, well, very big, it's the length of Belgium, it's not very big in comparison to France, but it's very big, and there's basically nothing, nobody lives up here, it's just the wild um, outdoors. You have Cal Californian and Subatic current here, that's why the water is so cold up there, and here's the Northwest Pacific Ocean. For samples, we had juvenile salmon, so the tiny salmon that have not gone anywhere, they're just hanging out in the lake where they were born. We have Pacific herring coming from all along the coast. We have bivalve, oysters, mussels, and clams, uh, also relatively coastal. And then we have various species of salmon. And as you might know, the salmon, after a year, goes away and goes in the ocean and uh, potentially all the way to eastern, to western Pacific and uh, what happens. So you're getting familiar with this diagram now, 208, 206, 206, 207, or local volcanoes, the, the Garibaldi volcanic belt, the plutonic rocks. We also have the composition of sediments, that's another collaboration with Catherine Chauvel. Here we have the dust uh, sampled along freeways, and that's the distribution of our uh, various marine biota. Now, interestingly, I'm going to guide you through the juvenile salmon, so the ones that have not gone anywhere, have the composition of the local rocks. They also have low levels. Then all our Sea shelves are here, basically close to the, the dust. The herring, as you can see, is only slightly, but it's elevated. It's going in that direction. And then the salmon is going towards the upper left of the diagram. Now, if you compare this, um, so what's happening is what's inland is down here. And as you go up, it's open ocean. You remember that trend? That was the trend we had in honey, where um, going towards anthropogenic up there. And where is the honey? As in here. So basically, the Vancouver honey, the downtown's honey are up there, quite overlapping. The same trend was observed in the California Central Valley air, eh? going up there. There's nothing natural in Western America up there. So it has to come from somewhere else. So Miling Li, who was a postdoc working with me, developed this measure, which is actually was already done by uh, Ewing, where you have here the legacy left, and the British Columbia lead line is about the same. When you take lead from China, it's the blue line. And so you can calculate the distance, the vertical distance between the two and measure what it does. And when you do that here, so that's what these things look like, we have also the isotopic composition of seawater and the, the seawater station, which are close to Vancouver here, plot here, the one that are going towards Asia, go towards the anthropogenic signature. And the seawater offshore of Japan is up there. So what we do is we calculate this distance here to know how much lead is coming from Asia. And that's what basically this, this diagram is showing you. Be all the samples, the marine biota that is coastal, and that's true in fish and in self shellfish, have a more elevated Asian contribution. And the question is, why? How can that happen? The winds are coming and going everywhere. It turns out that you have to look at boat traffic. That's all the vessels traffic density between 2014 and 2016. So you have Vancouver here. You can see that you have a lot of boats going along the coast and then you have routes going that way. Same thing for the tugboats. The remorqueurs, as you say in French, the ones that pull the big boats. You see a lot of traffic here. They're mostly transporting wood. 
And then the cruise ships, which are really common in the summer, uh, and uh, go along the coast. So that's why the, the pollution is higher on the coastal marine biota than the ones in the open ocean. And so to finish, you know, I think I, I hope I convince you that we find a clear trend in the lead isotopic composition in the various um, fish, and there is a difference between the inland fish and the open ocean fish. Initially, what we wanted to do is we wanted to analyze lead isotopic composition in the salmon to trace their mi migrato migratory paths. It doesn't work because the pollution dominates. And the elevated Asian lead impacts appears only in the coastal environment. And I'll finish here and thank him, all the team of the lab, the funding agencies, and I'm ready to happen any question in French or in English. Thank you.